Payne. Uh, he is actually one of our board members, and he's been very active in apologetics, creation of apologetics, um, for the last, what, 15, 20 years, I guess. He was on the board of uh, another creation group in Bellevue before this uh, for a number of years, and also on the board of uh, um, uh, the, the, the um, Mount St. Helens Creation Center. So, um, Rick, if we can bring up slide number five there. Yeah, okay, we got there. So the talk he's gonna have is a very strange title, Sexual Reproduction, God's Design. How do evolutionists explain if we started from one single living cell, how did we get into sexual reproduction of different living organisms? And he's gonna talk about some of the issues uh, of that. So with that, Ron, come on up. If you have a question, you know, you can ask it at the end. We'll have time for that as well. Thank you, Ron. Are we there? Close enough. There we go. Now we'll see if we can get this to work, right? Bear with us. Well, Thank you for letting me come today. Uh, I, have, uh, <clears throat> I have a degree in chemistry, and originally my most interesting topic that I thought a lot about was origin of life, because it has to do with chemicals getting together and forming life spontaneously. One of the talks I gave one time, I said uh, uh, that uh, dirt is dumb, and there's a reason for that. Dirt has no, you know, chemicals. Atoms don't have any directional uh, uh, purpose other than just doing what they do. So how did they coalesce together to get all of our life forms that we see? And originally I thought that was probably, for me, the most valuable tool I had as a Christian to understand God's creative nature. Until I got to thinking about something that's predominant in our world around us, and that's the issue of reproduction. So when you hear the word reproduction, what do you think of? What comes to your mind? There's a lot of different things that can pop up in our minds, isn't there? Well, I got to thinking about reproduction. Repro our, our whole world is focused on reproduction. Can you think of anything that's not reproduction? For example, our talk tonight, what's, my, what's our purpose? Our purpose is to develop a concept and reproduce that in your minds, isn't it? Reproduce that concept. When uh, we came into the building, somebody turned on a light switch, correct? When we went flick like that, what did we do? We wanted the effect of light in our room, so we did something. There was a cause that turned on out. We reproduced the effect we wanted to have. We live in a cause and effect world, don't we? Everything about it. Um, these chairs in the auditorium, they were reproduced in a factory, weren't they? According to a basic design for a purpose, correct? Did anybody go through a traffic light, you know, today? Not a red light, but you know what I mean, okay? Do you realize that that's a reproductive act? Did you know that? That's light, the light and the law that goes along with it is to reproduce a certain behavior in our life, isn't it? For a purpose, thankfully. That's, you, you probably didn't think of a traffic light as a reproductive process, did you? So everything in our world is like that. Even God in his infinite wisdom uh, left us with a command from Christ right before he ascended into heaven. What was it? Somebody say it. Go, Go therefore and what? Make. Make disciples. Is that a reproductive process? Of course it is. And further on, in, uh, in, uh, he said to Timothy, he said, what you've learned from me, go transfer to other people who will be able to what? Teach others also. That was a reproductive act, wasn't it? We have children and we teach them character traits. 
what are we doing? We're trying to reproduce proper character behavior in our kids, aren't we? I was sitting there one time just thinking about all the things that have to do with reproduction, and I couldn't hardly think of anything that I don't do that has something to do with reproduction. It's kind of amazing when you think about it. So tonight, we're going to talk about a specific area of reproduction called sexual reproduction. I'm a fisherman, and last summer I was on the Cowlitz River watching the king salmon spawn while I was trying to catch a few of them. And I was just amazed at their reproductive process that they were going through. It was really a kind of a neat experience. And that kind of got me started thinking about sexual reproduction, and that's actually the reason why I got into this, because I got to thinking about that, how valuable and important and critical that is. And how does that relate to evolution? So the topic is sexual reproduction, evolution's decisive downfall, God's decisive design. And just a little uh, caveat, uh, this is um, suitable for all audiences tonight. Well, there might be a couple things you might, you know, I'll, I'll warn you, but it is suitable, I'll guarantee you that. But I have a question for you first. We're gonna talk about something. Has anybody ever asked that question? Do horses fly? What would you say? Well, is it true? Is it absolutely true? How many would raise your hand to say it's absolutely true that horses can fly? Not a person. How about likely? Possible? Probable? How about improbable? How about impossible? Wait a second. Is there any other categories? We don't know. You don't know, okay. No, we don't okay. Well, so what, how do we determine that? The obvious answer in my mind is it's impossible. So why is it impossible? Most people would think that. Well, we apply some critical thinking to this situation, to this question, right? and we apply some logic to what we see in science and reality. That's sort of what critical thinking is about when you have questions like this. Okay? Let's see if I can get this to work. However, some people say absolutely. I've had a couple of people say that to me. Well, it kind of depends on your need or your want or your hope or perhaps an agenda. Has anybody ever talked to somebody that has an agenda that's kind of like way out into left field or right field, depending on how you look at it? We can change what science and reality and logic talks about by one of those things there. And I kind of think that has something to do with evolution too. And we're gonna talk about that tonight. So we're gonna talk about critical thinking when we look at the science and the logic and the reality of what we see and how that relates to reproduction and how it relates to evolution. By the way, there is a thing that does fly. There is one horse that flies, okay? Okay, if I can read this, it's hard for me. Our, my computer didn't talk to their machine or back there, so I'll have to strain my eyes. So what are the types of reproduction that we're talking about here? Well, re reproduction in systems are complicated, and some organisms exhibit multiple types and variation of the main types. It is a very complex subject, so we're gonna go be going sort of on the top surface, but get down to the bare points. The basic kinds are first what we call asexual, and that's basically a cloning, typically in single cell organisms or parasexual, that's a kind of a term I came up with, a kind of a crossover gene exchanges like in bacteria uh, is an example of that. Vegetative in, in terms of plants. I, I noticed there's a couple of people that work in the agriculture area here, we know about that. And then of course sexual, and that's where you have a male and female co-mingling of genetic material. And we're gonna focus on sexual reproduction Basically, because it has some real key points. One, it's exhibited in most multicellular organisms. It's amazing how many organisms do this, the vast majority. 
and expresses gene diversity and variation to the largest extent compared to cloning, for example. And it really has the most clear and direct effect on the validity of the evolutionary theory, which we're gonna focus on tonight. So, how does it fit into the evolutionary picture? That's the question. Well, I, uh, you know, I took some math class, so we're gonna have an equation here, a couple of equations, and kind of to simplify this. So, evolution starts out nothing to first life. You start with nothing, and it ends up just somehow with time, atoms, and energy, right? The Big Bang and such like that. Each of these issues have their own uh, creation apologetics evolutionary discussion points that we have to deal with, but we're not gonna talk about those tonight. This is just an equation form of simplifying what evolution is. Then, once you get these three things, you throw in chance chemical interaction, and guess what you get? What do you get? You have the first life showing up, the origin of life. And obviously there's many things we can talk about in terms of that and how that relates to the theory and its validity if we apply critical thinking, correct? Looking at reality and science. So once you have life, now the next step, we're working our way towards microbe demand. We take those, that first life and we add chance mutational changes. That's the foundation of evolution, mutations. And we add a factor that I think most people in the past in the discussions I've heard out have left this factor out. And this is a critical factor for our discussion tonight. You add those things up there with a sexual reproductive engine to pass on those gene changes. In order for random mutational changes to happen, you have to have a, a reproductive process, don't you, to pass it on. If you don't, all bets are off. On top of that, evolution says now you have a natural selective process that preserves the positive changes that were just reduced. Okay, does that make sense? So this is a real simple equation kind of picture of what evolution is like. And it's very simplistic. Each one of those factors in that equation has its own issues from an evolutionary creation apologetics point of view. Okay, let's see if we can get this. And as a result of that, evolution says we get new species or new organisms. Sexual reproduction, why is it so critical for evolution? Okay, now we're gonna get into it a little bit. This is interesting. Mr. Huxley said, the great tragedy of science is the slaying of a beautiful hypothesis by an ugly fact. Isn't that an interesting concept? Think about that. The great tragedy of, a, of science, the slaying of a beautiful hypothesis by an ugly fact. Again, think about critical thinking now. You remember back to that one slide, taking science and reality and logic and applying common sense thinking about it and how science relates together. He had a vision of that, didn't he? He said there may be a problem. Has anybody ever had a theory about something and it didn't prove out too well? It doesn't work too well, does it? Darwin said it a different way. It said if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ, or I added this, or process like sexual reproduction, existed which could not have possibly been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would what? Absolutely break down. Sexual reproduction in the evolutionary world has been called the queen of the evolutionary problems. Does anybody hear that comment before? The queen, the top dog, the highest point of evolutionary what? Problems. Now this is from the evolutionist's point of view, not from necessarily from a creationist's point of view. They've said that. Why? What is the ugly fact that, that Huxley was getting to? Okay, so in our presentation today, there's gonna to be 
two takeaway points. And this is the first one. And so we're going to be talking about this, and I'm going to solicit your response from time to time about what we're talking about. Sexual reproductive engine, remember that factor in the equation? Or process for passing genetic information from one generation to the next, any associated genetic changes has to be fully functional during the what? First generation. Think about that. If the reproductive process engine is not working in that equation, guess what? You don't proceed. There will be no second or third or fourth generations if it's not working, if it's not there fully functional. Not halfway, not a third, it has to be fully. And we're gonna talk about that. As a result, you're gonna get no new species, no evolution, it's the end. A beautiful ha uh, hypothesis what? <coughs> Slade, just like Huxley was saying. Sexual reproduction is a one generational issue. Okay, so you ready for this? I want everybody to say that. Sexual reproduction is a one generational issue. That's one of the major themes in this talk and we're gonna look into some details on that. Okay? And we gotta go back to that equation, remember? So what's the definition of generational? Well, for us in our talk, we're gonna talk about ge generational meaning an organism's lifespan. We're talking about reproduction. Does that make sense? This is not rocket science. Some reproduce only once, others reproduce multiple times, and when reproductive maturity is reached, varies widely depending on the organism. It really varies. Salmon do it how many times? Once in their lifetime. Okay, there's a lot that reproduce. I have some guppies in a tank and they reproduce frequently. <laughs> and a lot of them. <laughs> okay, so here's some examples. What do you suppose, looking at those animals up there, has the longest lifespan. Anybody want to guess? Tortoise. What? The tortoise. the tortoise, okay. How about the shortest? The house fly? Okay, well, let's see. Guess what? You're all wrong. Two hundred and twenty five years. Now again, this is a internet search of, you know animal lifespan, so there could be others, I could be wrong, but this is kind of a relative list, okay? Tortoise comes in second, and there are, there are animals in between, of course. Chimps, if I can get it to work, 50 years, and these are approximate years. Uh, salmon, two to seven, depending on the species. A dragonfly, four months. Housefly, about four weeks. A midge, five days, and the poor old mayfly. Their lifespan, reproductive lifespan, is five minutes. It comes out of the water, it flies around and mates, and it dies. It doesn't even eat. It doesn't have time to take one meal. Can you believe that? That's unbelievable. It's an unbelievable thing. Okay, so how does this relate to our one generational deal and the evolutionary process and that reproductive engine in that equation. Well, go back to microbes of man is a theory that absolutely breaks down and here's the reason, if I can read that, maybe I should turn around. No matter how old the earth is, a fully functional reproductive engine must be operating from the start during the which generation? First. For the mayfly, evolution has five minutes to get it right. Think about that. All of the reproductive processes, which are actually fairly complex in the mayfly, evolution had five minutes to get her done. This is not a good plan. For the koi, they're a lot better off. They get 225 years to get it right, the evolutionary process. <clears throat> Sexual reproduction is a one generational issue. Okay, so here's a copy of that last 
equation. Time plus mutational changes plus a sexual reproductive engine plus natural selection equals, uh-oh, what happens if you have a problem with your reproductive engine being fully functional? What's going to happen? No new species. No new organism. We're done. Guess what? And here's another thing that I think is very, very important to think about in this discussion tonight. Actually, long ages, which is the evolutionary viewpoint, is no longer a factor. If a mayfly has five minutes, what good is the world being 4.8 billion years old in terms of the evolutionary process? Does that have any bearing on it? Not a whole lot. If the reproductive engine is not functioning, you could, the world could be 150 billion years old. It really doesn't matter. Now, it's important to talk about timing, and there's issues with that from a creation apologetics evolution discussion point. But to me, this issue of reproduction being a one generational issue really makes age and time just not even important in my thinking. Does that make sense a little bit? Especially if you're a mayfly. If you have enough time, this is what evolution says, even the most irreducibly complex organism or process could possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications. For sexual reproduction says, if you're a mayfly, you got five minutes to get all this done. This is not a good plan. Long aging is not and is no longer a factor in my thinking. And I've really changed my mind about that because I've always, you know, we've all discussed in that issue with a lot of folks. But really this issue removes time from the equation as a factor. So, take away from the presentation. As Huxley said, the slaying of a beautiful hypothesis, evolution, is by an ugly fact. That's what his statement was. The ugly fact is, if I can get this to work. It's not working. I'm dead in the water. It's a one generational issue. It's a one generational <laughs> issue. Shall we go on? <laughs> Are you working on it back there? I hope. Maybe the battery's gone dead on this thing. Things were a lot easier when all we had were flannel graphs on. Yeah, or one of those, uh, I remember uh, those uh, viewer things where you write on a little oh, overheads. Yeah, that's what they're called. Okay. Okay. Sexual reproduction is a what? That's the ugly fact. So now we're going to talk a little bit more about detail. We've been talking to generalities right now. Asexual and sexual reproduction. There's two kinds. Asexual reproduction, remember, is typical with single-celled life forms. Like, you know, I can't see them from there. There's some algae and some, you know, there's an amoeba up there. Sexual reproduction is typical with the vast majority of multicellular animal species and significant types of plant species, like flowering seed producers. Notice there, the first animal over there is my, one of my favorite is a guppy. And Mrs. Chimp is there, and also my favorite flower, the marigolds. Now, you gotta remember in our discussion, we're talking to top level, re reproduction is extremely complex. There are a number of other reproductive processes, especially in the plant world, but also there are a number of parasexual gene transfer processes and reproductive sequencing combinations uh, within certain organisms and unique mechanisms for, for some species. So uh, 
there are a lot of weird reproductive processes out there. But generally speaking, what we're saying tonight is true of all of them. What is asexual reproduction? It's pretty simple. Duplicating genetic material, chromosomes of a parent cell of a particular plant or animal, and then the cell divides into two identical, fully functional daughter cells, identical to the parent with a, by a process called mitosis. You know, you'll probably forget that name, but that's okay. That's the name of it. It's called mitosis. It's simple cloning. The cell divides. Instead of one, you get two of them, and they're identical. I'm going to say it's real simple, but it's really not. <laughs> but the, the flow chart basically is, the concept is very simple. For example, skin cells in our skin, they don't reproduce sexually. They reproduce asexually by cloning. They just divide. And I'm really glad because I don't want my skin changing its genetic characteristics every time it reproduces. This is not a good plan for our skin. We would die. Uh, human blood cells in a, in a typical adult, every day you are asexually reproducing over a billion blood cells every day, depending on how big you are. That's a lot of reproduction going on in you guys, and it's going on right now in this room. Did you guys know you're all reproducing right now? Isn't that cool? Think about that. It's a good thing, too. What is sexual reproduction? A little bit more complicated. <clears throat> See if I can read it. Genetic material from male and female. Well, there's a new term that we didn't have in cloning. You don't have to have male and female. It's a good thing, or it might be kind of weird. Cells of a parent organism are reduced by one half via a process called meiosis. You guys got that down? Mitosis? Meiosis. That's your scientific confusion terms for today. During fertilization, the male and female reproductive cells, each containing half of the original number of chromosomes, co-mingle to form a new immature, emphasis immature, daughter cell containing genetic traits of both parent cells. That's what meiosis is. Is it a little different than cloning? It's a lot different. Way different. Totally different. After gestation period, the immature daughter cell matures to a new fully functional organism exhibiting a combination of genetic traits of both original parents for that particular organism, and here's a cool thing, with a specific male or female designation or distinction. Isn't that cool? That's a little bit different than what we're hearing today, isn't it? But that's one of the results of meiosis. Sexual reproduction is one time you get a male, one time you get a female, and it's just, it's amazing. And it's a good thing, too. So, human example, we start out with a normal cell, 46 chromosomes. The male sperm has 23, the female 23, and the embryo ends up with 46. Well, you go from 46 to 23 in each of the male and female by the meiosis process. Then, if this thing works, you have a fertilization process in whatever species you're lock looking at, and you end up with an embryo, in this case for the human, with 46. That's a good plan. I think that worked out pretty good, don't you? And we get a little baby. My uh, newest grandson is six months old, Braxton, and that's exactly what happened to him inside his mom. I think that was really cool. And then you have gestation and birth. The origin of sexual reproduction, very interesting question. Generally, evolution teaches that sexual reproduction evolved from asexual reproduction, mitosis to meiosis. That's what's generally thought. In this presentation, we're going to assume that asexual reproduction uh, evolved, which has its own problems, of course, because it's very complex. But we will focus on 
the origins and issues relating around sexual reproduction. So we understand the difference now? Asexual, sexual, mitosis, meiosis. Now the next slide, if I remember correctly, is the most complicated slide. If I can get it up, nope, it's the next one. Let's look at some ugly facts and apply some critical thinking and logic. Remember that? We started with that. Sexual reproduction being a what? One generational problem. Critical thinking, and here's something I wanna throw in here that's fairly important. That is a tactic that evolutionists will present when we're talking about reproduction. <clears throat> Regarding the evolution of reproduction, sexual reproduction, and that actually for anything that matter, justifying the validity of evolution is not based on what? Why sexual reproduction is, is good. The fact that it exists, that's another ploy. The real question comes down to is how? So when a person, an evolutionist, or when you're having a discussion, an apologetics debate or discussion, if we get to talking about why and the fact that it exists, the question comes then, well, what about how? How did it happen? <clears throat> so now we're going to get into some of it, some of the details. This is kind of like a list of, of different issues related to sexual reproduction and the, the hows, thinking, applying critical thinking to the issue in the topic on the slide. Sexual reproduction, the DNA code, I gotta read here. For any trait to be expressed, that's generally, to actually happen, there must have been evolved a set of DNA coding for that trait, right? Correct? Including what? Sexual reproduction process, correct? Where did the DNA code for sexual reproduction come from when we assume there was only asexual available? Because asexual has its own series of coded information for the asexual process. And if that mutated somehow into a sexual process, that means the DNA code must have changed to, do, to allow the DNA code for reper sexual reproduction to happen. Question, how did that happen? And we're gonna get into a little scenario here in this next question. How did natural selection select for sexual reproduction when sexual reproduction is first required for natural selection? To operate. Isn't it sort of like a major circular region issue? You had to have sexual reproduction in order to develop sexual reproduction. This is really a difficult problem. No code, no sexual reproduction, guess what? No evolution. And there's nothing in the asexual process that is even similar to the sexual process. So we're gonna see that in just a second here. Asexual to sexual, mitosis to meiosis. Here's the slide. Everybody see that? Got your focuses on? This is just a, a simple graphic of the process. It is extremely complex if you list out all the different steps that we understand these processes go by. On the left hand A side is asexual mitosis, cloning. On the B side is meiosis and that's the sexual reproductive process, simplified. In the middle is what we start with, a parent cell. So in asexual, you remember, first you have a duplication of the chromosomes in the A section, and then they kind of line up together, and the two cells split, and guess what? You got two identical daughter cells that are identical to the original parent. That's pretty simple, isn't it? This is not hard. Okay, so somehow that had to mutate into B process, meiosis, sexual reproduction. 
uh, it's a little bit different. Basic, sim the basic structure steps are you have your chromosome duplication just like before, but instead of separating out like it has in the second step on A, what happens is that the chromosomes are duplicated and then they form groups of four, a tetrad. Okay, don't ask me the details because these are super complex and we don't have time for that. Basically what happens, the chromosomes group together in tetrads and during that time, gene transfer and crossover happens. In other words, little bits of gene codes from one chromosome switches over to the, the other one and vice versa. Okay? Does that have anything, any similarity to the asexual process? Not in the slightest. It is way different. Can you imagine the DNA code that drives that and all the chemicals and enzymes that would have to drive that? Very, very complex. Then you go through a, um, a second, what's called a metaphase, and you actually do have a meiosis process on the third part, there where you, that's the anaphase and telophase, down there on the third box, where they actually do duplicate cells. And then you have another meiotic division, and you end up with four sex cells with half the chromosomes. Is that a little bit different than A process? It's a lot different. It's, a lot different. it's totally different, isn't it? So the evolutionary process for going from asexual to, ace to sexual seems a little bit far-fetched. And here's some, maybe some questions or comments to maybe look at. One, genetic instructions for sexual meiosis would interfere with the mitosis process terminating redu reproduction. Imagine in the asexual process over there inserting in, in a sexual phase that would end the cloning process. It would mess it up. It's like throwing a wrench in the gears. You know what I mean? It's just not gonna happen. <clears throat> half asexual, half sexual. Meantime, nothing happens. And for the mayfly, how long does it have to, does evolution have to get this done? It has five minutes to get her done. This is a little bit hard to understand and believe. It would take me longer to catch a mayfly than it would be for them. Anyway, sexual meiosis would have to concurrently develop in both the male and female organism. Because you've got to understand that B section of meiosis has, goes on in the male and it goes on in the female simultaneously, doesn't it? Well, that's adding a little bit of a factor that has nothing to do with cloning. This is not making a lot of sense, is it? Do you see the complicated differences? and how it sort of like begs the question, you know, how did this happen? Without sexual meiosis, how would we get male and female in the first place? That's an interesting factor because as, as a result of that, you know, you don't get all males, do you, in sexual reproduction? You don't get all females. It's not a cloning process. Sometimes you get a male, sometimes you get a female. That's where the, the last, those divisions, when we get half the chromosomes, one of those chromosomes happens to be a male-female chromosome. And sometimes it gets in the sex cell and sometimes it doesn't. Can a, asexual mitosis account for new reproductive organs and biochemicals required for sexually reprodu reproductive organisms since they are not present in the asexual organisms? There's a whole set of enzymes and chemicals and very complex uh, you know, chemistry that's going on there that's just not in the asexual process. Correct reproductive DNA code, we talked about that. And here's an interesting fact. Sex cells exactly have 50% of the original DNA. Isn't that interesting? Why not 45? Why not 80? Well, that would cause a problem, wouldn't it, when they get together? This is it's just an interesting little tidbit. 
Complete transition from asexual to sexual in the first generation, what do you think? Apply some critical thinking? If not, then no second generation dead yet. Okay, another subject. Male and female, who came first in this sexual reproductive process? Because you have to have male and female, don't you? Right? Those are sockeye salmon, by the way, if you don't know, recognize them. What happens if you have a male or a female, but no male shows up? She's probably happy. Maybe. <laughs> Except for one thing. She can't reproduce, and that's a toast on that species, isn't it? Well, see, the male has a problem, and we're going to talk about that later. Male and female simultaneously, simultaneously in the first generation. <laughs> if not, well, guess what happens? No next generation. Just a small problem. Male and female physical design. I'm not all here. If we have half a male... They both show up, but they're not really quite developed fully for that particular species. Is that a problem? Houston, we really do have a problem, don't we? The fuel tank, there's no fuel in the tanks. This is a problem. How does fertilization happen? How does gestation happen? How does birth, egg hatching, seed formation, or germination happen if you only have half the structures, half the enzymes, half the chemicals? A little bit of a problem. See, it has to be there what? Simultaneously. Does that make sense? It's not just a minor problem. It's a major problem. And if not, what happens? No second generation. We're not just talking about no species. We're, not, we're just talking about the next generation. And for the mayfly, that's important. Okay, here's the... I'm sorry for this risque picture of actual sexual organs in an organism, but I thought this would be okay. Faster, is that okay? Yeah, we're good. Okay. So here's a male and female example <clears throat> of a flower. So where's the male part and where's the female part? Well, what's called the pistil, which is that center vase-shaped structure, is the female part of the plant, of the flower. And down in the bottom part, in this particular diagram, is the ovary where the ovule is, or the immature meiotic, mitosis developed egg, okay? So where are the sperms, the male part? Well, they're over on the stamen. You guys know this, basically. Okay? So what would happen if you had the uh, pistil, the female part, but you had no anther on top of the filament? It hadn't developed yet. Would there be a problem? A big time problem. You can't have a flower you know, generating seeds with no male part, or half a male part. Okay, so in this case, the pollen, or the male sperm, if you will, lands on top of the stigma up there in the middle, and then it actually, there's a couple of them that do that. It's a very complex process. One of them drills a hole down to the, oval, uh, the ovary, and then the other one comes down and fertilizes the egg. Isn't that interesting? Because that's a solid piece of stuff there in the stigma and the style. It's not open to the environment. The actual one of the pollen grains actually drills a hole in there chemically and makes a pathway. Did you guys know that? That's a pretty good deal that it does that, doesn't it? It's really handy for the flower. Teamwork makes the dream work. Oh, it works really well. And for the, uh, the marigolds, you get one season to do that. That has to be done the first time. Otherwise, guess what happens? No second generation. Okay. The male and female physical design for reproduction is critical for a particular species. 
We talked about the flower over on the left-hand side. Uh, you have to have unique morphology for each species. And the male and female forms have to be compatible in that morphology, don't they? If they don't match, I don't care how, much, how many sex cells you have, you're not going to have reproduction. So they have to be able to physically be the same. Interesting. See over on the right-hand side that, what are those? Pine cones, right? Here, I'm sorry to say, if you're embarrassed, is a female ovary. Would anybody like to hold this? You want to pass it around? Anybody want to hold a female ovary? <laughs> this is a female ovary from a pine tree. Interesting. And um, God in his wisdom has uh, seen fit to make pine cone seeds in, in a really strange way compared to what we normally think, isn't it? Anybody knew that? That was a female ovary? How many people knew that was a female ovary? I told you before, you turkey. You rode with me. The males are those little tiny things. And they, sometimes they have catkins and sometimes little buds. It depends on the tree. They're all different structure. And their purpose is to what? Generate pollen. You know that yellow stuff that floats around from various trees? You know a lot of that? Those are male sex cells, so be careful. <laughs> well, it only affects you if you're a pine cone. So there you go. And we're going to talk about that in a minute, by the way. So don't let me forget that. Match compatible male and female morphology simultaneously in the what? First generation. Or what? No reproduction. This is not hard. Specialized organs facilitating reproduction. Does anybody in this room have a pituitary gland? Some of you don't? Well, this is very interesting because all mammals have pituitary glands. Or all vertebrates, let's put it that way. Okay? Are you a vertebrate? Guess what? You have a pituitary gland. Where is it? Right there in your brain. Okay, every one of you have, oh, Heinz, right? Where's Heinz? Okay, right? Are pituitary glands important? Very. What'll happen if it doesn't work? You're dead, right? There's another thing that won't happen if you don't have a pituitary gland. No second generation. You know why? because the pituitary gland releases hormones controlling sperm formation and the timing of egg meiosis and the release of those things. Is that interesting? It's located in the brain, it's the size of a marble, and it's nowhere near any morphology relating to sexual reproduction. But it generates the chemical, the hormone that stimulates those things. That's interesting. And not only that, it has a lot of other hormones that control all kinds of things in your body besides reproduction. This is an interesting thing. Are we stuck again? I keep trying to push this. I don't know if I should or not. It's broken now. Sorry, we're at the end. No reproduction. Single generational issue. It's exactly what it amounts to. Okay, here we go. Prostate gland. How many of you have prostates in this room? All right, well, some of us do. Some of us guys. Male mammals all have prostate glands. It's located at the base of the kidney, or the bladder. I learned about this when I was having a biopsy on my, my prostate about 
three years ago looking at the chart in the doctor's office. You know those charts? It was really cool. I learned a lot. I learned that if, I, if we didn't have prostates, there would be no reproduction. Amazing. It releases a fluid protecting sperm entering the female reproductive tract. It's a good plan. I'm glad God did that. Otherwise, you know what? I wouldn't have to worry about it because I wouldn't be here. Neither would you. So that's kind of a specialized organ. And it landed in the right place for the right purpose. <clears throat> well, we'll be fair. Ovaries. They produce and store and release eggs for fertilization. Immature eggs are reproduced by mitosis. That's immature eggs. And then undergo meiosis prior to release. Controlled by the pituitary gland. This is cool. It controls the number of eggs released for fertilization. One or thousands, depending on the species or organism. It releases hormones also to facilitate reproduction. I'm kind of glad that ovaries exist. Or guess what? I wouldn't be here. Does that make sense? Think about these, though. All of these things have to be present in the particular species, what? At the same time, performing their functions with the appropriate releases of chemicals and structures and all that. Some, like the pituitary gland, also support other non-reproductive body functions. That's interesting. It wasn't driven by reproduction at all, was it? Thousands of different organisms have varied organs and structures matched to their unique reproductive system. We kind of think in just in terms of us, you know what I mean? But we're talking about thousands and thousands of different organisms have all kinds of different characteristics when it comes to reproductive structures. How did the, all the required organs form at the same time? And by the way, in order to form them, you would have had to have reproduction and something. There's a problem there, isn't there? <clears throat> How did multipurpose pituitary gland form just the right reproductive hormones? These are just questions to think about. How could thousands of different reproductive organs and structures form compatibly matched with the specific thousands of different organisms? That's a good thing, by the way. What mechanism? We're right back to the same thing. Mechanism drove the DNA coding. Here's an example. How could a placenta, an organ that nourishes the developing fetus, develop slowly from a non-placental common ancestor? How could it do it slowly? Emphasis, slowly. If you're a mayfly, how long do you get to do it? Five minutes. Well, they don't have a placenta, so, but you know what I mean. Required organs for simul forming simultaneously in the first generation. If not, what? No second generations. Oh, this is cool. Anybody ever use an ATM? What do you got to have in order to get in your ATM? Money. Money, <laughs> but you also mostly have to have a PIN number. Well, guess what? There is a thing called a fertilization pin number that exists. This is cool. Eggs and sperm of the same species have species specific chemical codes and corresponding receptor preventing cross fertilization from other species. Isn't that interesting? Humans have a unique code. You cannot mate with anything else in this entire universe, at least on Earth. Okay? Because you have, we have pin codes that prevent us from cross fertilizing in another species. Now, there are a couple exceptions, like a mule, and a, but I'm talking generally speaking. It's a handy safety feature for spawning fish. So, guess, guess where fish spawn? In the, in the water. Guess how many fish spawn in the water? Most of them. Guess how many sponges do that? Guess how many of every kind of sea creature does that? And the ocean is full of eggs and sperm floating around. And it's a good thing that salmon don't mate with uh, dogfish 
or whatever, or sharks. They do other things with sharks, or the sharks do them, but not mate. It is a good plan. How do the same species codes and receptors gradually form? They're all different. They're all unique. A perfect matching code formed concurrently in the male and the female? Well, that's handy. Not only do you have to have it species specific, but they have to be specific for the male and female on top of it, times thousands and thousands of them. <clears throat> Transitioning species would require simultaneous pin number changes. Did you know that DNA code for one pin code set cannot pass on a new set? It's self-limiting on purpose. It prevents spawning new life forms on purpose. And that's a good plan, especially if you're a fish. Unique pin numbers in the first generation? If not, what? No second generation. You get, kind of getting a picture of things here? Is it all building up? Transition points on the evolutionary tree Amphibians converted into reptiles over time, correct? Generally, that's what the evolutionary tree says, right? Well, there's a little problem, many problems. Amphibians reproduce by external fertilization, okay? Reptiles produce by internal fertilization with an amniotic egg, which means it has a nutrient sac around the egg, around the uh, embryo. Uh, and that's, there are a couple exceptions, but this is it. So let me ask you a question. How could the first reptilian amniotic egg develop from an amphibian non-amniotic egg through a small successive mutational changes? Well, it might be kind of devastating on the offspring on the way, don't you think? How many successive permutations would it take to develop physical structures to facilitate internal fertilization in reptiles compared to simple egg and sperm discharge in amphibians? It's a whole different process structurally and physically. How could fully functional male and female reptiles develop simultaneously? Back to that old problem. How could the reptile egg develop a shell developed from an amphibian soft, moist egg membrane, because they are different, way different. And if it doesn't happen in the first generation, guess what happens? Problem. Oh, this is the fun part. I love this part. Reproductive rituals. You know what that means? Mating dances and things like that. Reproductive instincts and drives required in both, both male and females at the what? Same time, I watch my, female, my male guppies chase the females around all day long. That's all they do, <laughs> driving them nuts. Anyway, thousands of organisms, each with unique mating dances, tied to what? Meiotic maturity of sperm and egg. For what purpose? Anybody have an idea? Reproduction. Now, with the salmon, the male didn't show up because he was chasing herring, okay? No matter what the female, somebody said the female would enjoy that, well, it's a problem. He has to show up, and fortunately, they do tend to do that. If the mating drives aren't matched in the first generation, guess what happens? Oh, I love this, this is my favorite slide of the whole deal. Anybody ever heard of a deep sea angler fish? Is that ugly or what? Good it is ugly, man. It's an ugly mother. And I'm, just, I'm not saying that. That is the actual mother. That's what the mother looks like. Okay? Where's the male? Right there. The male actually comes up and it bites the belly of the female if it finds it down in the dark, okay? That little light bulb on the front helps a lot, but the male doesn't have one. So anyway, and he bites onto the female and the male's circulatory system commingles as a parasite with the female, permanently, forever, until the female dies. 
And then when the female dies, the male dies, because guess where he gets his nutrition from? What's the advantage for an angular fish down in the deep, dark ocean? She has a constant supply of sperm along with her all the time. This is a good plan if you're an angler fish. Don't you think? Makes sense to me. But how bizarre, huh? That's probably the most bizarre one I've ever found. How did this system evolve in the first generation? It would have taken them years to find a stupid female, let alone. <laughs> anyway, if not, what happens? No new generation. Now, you, you ladies, you like your husbands, right? Right? Yes. But there are times when you may not want to have them around. Is that correct? Sometimes? Okay. I'm not looking at you specifically. Okay, so that's a list of a number of things, okay? There's all kinds. You could go on and on with different kind of facets of this. So, summarizing, how do the evolutionists, what papers, what theories, what uh, papers and books and presentations tell us how sexual reproduction evolved? I have a list of them here for you. You ready? <laughs> That's exactly how many there are. They have no clue, no clue. When you get papers about sexual reproduction, they'll tell you why and because it exists. But they have no clue of how it happened because it just defies critical thinking. Even their agenda-driven thinking doesn't work because there's no viable method. Does that make sense? It is, that is unbelievable. It's called the queen of evolutionary problems for a reason. You know this guy, right? Mr. Dawkins? Listen to this, you will not believe this. The other assumption I have glossed over, that of the existence of sexual reproduction and crossing over meiosis, is more difficult to justify. This is an extremely difficult question for evolutionist answers. I frankly am going to, what? Is there a reason? That was in the selfish gene. In the blind watchmaker, he said, for reasons that I haven't the space to go into, the existence of sexual reproduction poses a big theoretical puzzle for Darwinians. Hmm. This guy, Graham Bell, not the, the, you know what I mean. There's another Graham Bell, right? Sex is the queen of problems in, the evolution, in evolutionary biology. Perhaps no other natural phenomenon has aroused so much interest. Certainly none has shown mu so much confusion. The insights of Darwin and Mendel, which have illuminated so many mysteries so far, have failed to shed more than a dim and wavering light on the central mystery of sexuality. It's kind of telling. So what conclusions can we make? We're almost done here. Sexual reproduction is like a flying horse. It's evolution's decisive downfall. Sexual reproduction is not evolution's holy grail, but it's holy fail. The logical conclusion or deduction should be, considering what we've just gone through, is what does the Bible have to say about that? It's rational, reasonable to believe that God, un, not unknown events, created sexual reproduction, what? Fully functional to facilitate the what? First generation of life. And there's a reason for that. What's the reason? If it's not fully functional, what happens? No life. <clears throat> sexual reproduction is God's decisive plan all along, isn't it? Where did Mr. and Mrs. Sockeye Salmon come from and develop the ability to sexually reproduce from the get-go? Where? Well, the Bible tells us. What does it say? Sexual reproduction is what? God's first... Isn't that true? He didn't say go out and share the gospel or to obey me. He said, go reproduce. 
What does that tell you about how important that is? God created a reproducing world, a cause and effect world. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God. He created him, male and female, he created them. Maybe God is a reproducing God. He loves to reproduce image bearers, doesn't he? And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. That sounds like sexual reproduction to me, don't you? From the get-go. God made Adam and Eve what? Fit for each other. What did he mean by that? Well, what does it mean? A A relational partner spiritually and emotionally and mentally to understand and honor and cherish and value God and each other and the physical compatibility to reproduce. The ability to obey his first command. This is a good plan. I think God was smart, didn't he? He had things together. In the context of God providing a fit part for Adam, God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to man. But for man there was not found a helper, what? Fit for him. Part of that fitness is the ability to reproduce sexually. Correct? Not fit for Adam? What does that mean? Well, how about Mrs. Chimp? Does she qualify? She's married. Did you say buried or married? She's married. She's a missus. I know. Disqualified. Oh, I see. (laughs) How about Mrs. Sockeye Salmon? Is he fit for Adam for reproduction purposes? How about Mrs. Cobra? Cobra. I hope not. Ready for this? Certainly not her. Right? All the wrong reproductive requirements. Chromosomes, organs, pin numbers, specialized organs, and obviously the relational and spiritual fit that they had. God designed suitable fit mates for all creatures according to their kinds. And he did it when? in the first generation. Otherwise, it wouldn't work. That's God's plan. It's cool. I'm glad he did it that way. So, the takeaway, the slaying of a beautiful hypothesis, evolution by an ugly fact. The ugly facts are, what's the first ugly fact? It's a first generational problem. It's a one generational problem, the first one. Second takeaway, these are really important. Evolutionary time is not a factor. It has nothing to do with it. It all has to do with reproduction and what's needed in the first generation. Does that make sense, guys? Huh? This is a cool book. I'd highly recommend you get this book. You can get it on Amazon. Darwin's Secret Sex Problem. Isn't that a cool title? This guy is so fun in how he does this. Very smart and intelligent way of developing it. And he talks about theistic evolutionists in the back and is not too kind on that either. Very highly recommend this guy. L. Lagarde Smith. Very, very well-written book. This is our task, Right? Be prepared with a solid defense. And so when I talk to an evolutionist and the next time I do, and he brings up time, I'm going to ask him about, what about sexual reproduction? Have you thought about that? What do you think it takes? How about a midge? Five minutes. It's got to have you done. Mike Riddle, I like his questions. How do you know it's true? Has it ever been observed? Are you making any assumptions? It really fits for this discussion topic, doesn't it? You can prepare by, you know, being involved like you are. You guys know that. And, uh, you know, we can do the things we're doing and read books. And, but think about it. The point is, is, get a subject and think about it. And get some information. Read a dumb biology book. It will really impress you. 
We talked about field trips. A couple verses and then we're done. I love these verses. Psalms 118.8. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than put confidence in man's dumb evolutionary viewpoint that has been slayed by an ugly fact. Right? I love this next one too. Great are the works of the Lord studied by those who have pleasure in them. Isn't this pleasurable to think about that? You know, God is good. He made us fit for each other and every other animal and plant. This is a cool verse. I just found this in my quiet time a couple days ago. I had to throw this in there. Daniel and his three friends were trained by Nebuchadnezzar and his cohorts to be skillful in wisdom, cunning in knowledge, and what? It's actually in the King James Version. They use the word science. Isn't that cool? And Daniel was a pretty cool guy. I mean, these guys were young kids. These were teenagers when, he was, when they were captured by Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar had the wisdom to teach these guys to get into science and other, other you know, knowledge-based things for the purpose of what? Having wise people around him. I thought that was pretty cool. So I'm done. Any questions? Dan. Yep. Th thank you. Uh, oh, do I get to ask my question? Yeah. <laughs> so, <clears throat> if I if I remember correctly, you said that in the ovary, the 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 individual ova are reproduced via mitosis, correct? To start with, yes. So that would mean they're all identical. The immature. The, the eggs. Th they're actually parent, forty-six chromosome. The eggs are, have 46 chromosomes in them. They're a fully human cell. Just like the sperm is when it's first generated is a fully human 46 total chromosomes. And those okay. are reproduced via mito by mitosis. Mitosis, cloning. To, for example, are sperm cells in, in an animal? Right. You create you know, some millions of them, okay? And they're the immature, they're not, full, they're not ready for fertilization because they're not sex cells yet. Right. And then they, during, after they're cloned and reproduced, they go through the mitosis, meiosis process, which splits them into 50% of the chromosomes. And so that, 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 that subsequent meiosis process is what results in the diversity between them. Correct. Okay. And That's for example, the okay. pituitary gland is key in that because it stimulates the, the meiosis process of the immature sex cell. When I say immature sex cell, it's not, it's, a, it's got 46 chromosomes in it and then it, the pituitary gland does its thing and then the meiosis, mitos, meiosis process splits them into 23 chromosomes actual sex cells, which then they can fertilize each other. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Good question. That's a very good question. Yes. Okay, other questions out there? I'll bring the microphone so we can record that as well as the uh, answer. Th this is another thing you can bring up to your evolutionist friend. How would they answer this question? You know, first to second generation. There is no good answer. As uh, Darwin, uh, you know, it cannot come up with an answer to that question. But if there's other questions that uh, of sure. Ron, that you have, <laughs> Dan has another. One. <laughs> so the the weakness that I see in your your original argument that you know, it's the the original argument is a scientific one, right? So you you talked about the, the is there a flying horse? So, in order for us to definitively say it is impossible for a horse to fly, we would have to have infinite knowledge, right? Because we would have to be able to sample, we have to look at all four, <clears throat> at all, we'd have to have exhaustive knowledge. But because we're dealing with a scientific process, we're dealing with deduct or inductive reasoning rather than deductive reasoning. So at best we could say it's highly improbable, right? Because science, science cannot make definitive claims. Well, I right. guess absolutely that's true because we're not God and we, right. don't, we don't have total view of everything. However, what we do have, we can only work with what we have. 
Right. What we have is we have science facts. Okay, like in the horse's fly deal, uh, you, we have aerodynamic principles. Mm -hmm. We have, you know, a, a number of scientific facts that relate to a horse being able to fly. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we also have reality of what we actually see practically in our world. Mm -hmm. So you're right, technically speaking, we can't absolutely, totally, beyond all shadows of doubts, you know, because we don't know, we're no, we don't have the infinite knowledge. Right. However, we can only go, we can only make a deduction based on what we know and see. Right, but that's the, the, the weakness then becomes, because this is exactly where evolutionists go, right? They're going to invoke a rescuing device, and they're just going to say, well, we haven't figured that out yet. Correct. And they wiggle their way out of the problem. Right. Right. But so, saying I don't know is not a really good answer, like you said. But it, it isn't. Is a, well, we just don't it, know yet. It, it is an answer. So help me understand how it's going. Can you show <laughs> any process so far that's even approaching an answer? Show me a paper. Show me a that talks about the how versus the why, is it, for example, in this case. Right. You're, you're, you're absolutely, absolutely correct. But again, the typical average person, we have a hard time discussing just the bare science facts, let alone what you're talking about. But you're right, somebody in a more sophisticated argument would, would perhaps say that. But for me, for the normal person, uh, common sense goes a long way. When, it, when we, but we have to look at some facts rather than just an opinion. Does that make sense? And that's why we go to scripture. And that's why we go to scripture, but it's also we go to, we go to the, the world that God has made and how it operates and ask those questions. How? Good yeah. question. Good I comment. have just a practical question about what your experiences are with local school districts and other places. Is most of the people here are out of high school? Uh, and we have grandchildren that are going to schools, et cetera. And I'm just wondering here in Sonoma County where you have apologetics and lots of resources and interests through the churches, what has been, uh, do you ever get invited or does anybody interested in the public schools or other places where you have audiences of people that should be hearing what you have to say? Not in Washington in very much. The answer is I don't think so. Well, I think, it, I think you answered the, sort of the question yourself in some respects. You said, we have grandchildren. I was talking to one of the other gentlemen here, for example. We can, um, it's hard to get into a public forum, especially in schools. I don't know, uh, some have been able to do that, you know, uh, public schools. Christian schools, you have a little bit more access. I know, Dan, you've taught there. Um, it, but uh, what I see is that you have grandkids, right? Okay, so you have some information now yourself, and I have that I have some grandkids that I can affect, for example, and I can have uh, I can have a real influence on them and their friends and their acquaintances, and help give them structure to their faith, and let them be able to have um, the ability to ask critical questions when they're confronted themselves in, you know, in, in their education process. The, yes. Yes. I know of people that, have do, that do that mm -hmm. and have done that. And like Bill Hosh down in the Mount St. Helens, uh, he's the director. He's done a number of those kind of efforts down in, in action in California and Texas, doing just exactly what you've said. Different subjects, but apologetics, science type subjects. But it really depends on the state and, and the schools and their openness. But I think in Washington, I think we're probably running up against a, you know, a, a brick wall. Uh, one of the other things is making sure that your church is teaching biblical principles. Exactly. Like let the pastor letting us come in and talk about sexual reproduction here, right? <laughs> this is really important because, you know, there, there are some subjects that are 
Laura Bolton, and there's, there's some uh, issues generally that people don't want to talk about. I remember the, the uh, pastor in our, in the church that I went to in Bothell, he was uh, very clear that he did not want to talk about controversial subjects like evolution and creation in his, in public and in the church. He really didn't want to do that. And it was just, it was heart wrenching. It really was. That, that is a challenge for us. You know, we, we do bring speakers into Christian schools here and uh, we do bring speakers to, we probably brought them to 15 different churches, not just in Snohomish, but also as far as Bellevue and uh, Bellingham. So we make an effort to do that. And we have a website that has a lot of information. All these talks are recorded. So there, there is a place where you can get information. And uh, there are uh, uh, you know, answers books which answer common questions. Uh, we, we had uh, Juan Valdez here in February, and uh, he, he goes to um, uh, teach at youth camps. And uh, he and Carl Kirby, they came up with a book uh, answering the 28 most common questions that our youth have. It's a very, very useful book. In fact, we, um, when he was here, we sold 100 copies to di at the different churches. We bought another 32, and I think we have maybe 10 or so left. So it's a very popular answers book that have common questions, not just science questions, but also questions on culture. But uh, let, me, let me bring this to an end and you can you know, ask Ron some more questions after. We're gonna take a break. Let me just finish up here. Um, next month, we have um, Chris Ashcraft, um, he's got his own uh, apologetic symposium where he brings speakers in as well in Bothell at Cedar Park Church, but we haven't come here. He, he's very appropriate for this kind of an audience because he teaches children in a, of course, in a Christian school setting. He teaches them Christian science and a lot of issues associated with that. So he's, he's very well versed in, in the issues. He's got a lot of talks online. We're gonna have him talk on the topic of worldview and conflicts because that, that is the challenge we have. You know, we have a Christian biblical worldview. How does that compare with the, with the other worldviews out there? It's very important for us to understand that. And uh, you know, we just need that information. So he'll be here next uh, month on July 22nd. So with that, and I, I encourage you to look at the apologeticsforum.org website. They've got a, a menu item there called Find Answers. You can type in your question in English and uh, you'll get all kinds of biblical answers that uh, are appropriate uh, for the particular question. There's a, a lot of flyers in the back. I mentioned these uh, um, two courses that Mike is doing. The, the one in... in uh, in um, uh, North Carolina, that's a five-day course, pretty intense. But uh, you may know somebody that have, would have an interest in doing that. There's a flyer in the back on that. There's another flyer for the course that Mike's going to be doing, basic creation training. It's going to be in uh, Calvary Chapel, Lake Stevens, not too far from here. Um, so we're signing up for that. You can just go to the apologeticsforum.org website. Look, click on BCT, Basic Creation Training, and you find more information and you can sign up. And of course, if you're interested in doing a creation tour, talk to Ron further. He leads tours himself, but we also have Bill Hosh at Mount St. Helens who does tours um, all the time during the summer. So if those things are an interest to you, talk to, uh, to Ron. Many, most of you are subscribed to our newsletter. Um, I send out messages a few times a month, but if you're not, there's a sign-up sheet on the back. You can add your name and uh, mailing address to that. There are donation to boxes in the back. That's how we support this ministry. Uh, you, you'll make any donation that you're willing to do to help um, support that. So with that, I'm going to close in a word of prayer. There's a lot of resources to look at back there, and we have some refreshments for you to enjoy as well. Father, we come to you just to thank you for this time. We thank you for the audience. Thank you for the questions. Thank for Ron for bringing the message to us. 
and that this presents one of many challenges that evolutionists have to explain their theory because there really are no science answers to the, the, the questions that we bring up here. And uh, it's hard to get through, but we need to continue to gather the information, the knowledge to answer questions that they might have about our faith as well. And we thank you for the resources that are available here. And Jesus, we pray. Amen.